Well, hello and welcome to another amazing guest interview here on the Profit with Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsal, and uh, I have a, a, a guest I'm really, really excited about today. Uh, this is somebody who I've been watching from afar. Uh, you know, he's he works specifically with uh, personal injury attorneys, and um, I've just been seeing seeing what he's putting out there into the world and seeing the the the, the attorneys that are coming out of his organization. Uh, and I'm really really excited about the fact that we're able to get him to clear his calendar for us and spend uh, close to an hour with me and a conversation that hopefully will be uh, something that really, really helps a bunch of you. Uh, he's got a lot of knowledge between those airs, and we're going to try to extract as much of it as possible for you. So I'm excited to uh, bring Ken Hardison onto the show. Um, Ken is the founder of Pilma, and um, he's known as the millionaire maker uh, due to his coaching clients doubling and quadrupling their law practices and income following his practice growing advice and insights. As founder and president of Pilma, he devotes his time helping attorneys build their own, pre their own preeminent law practices with proven marketing strategies and management resources. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, my friend. All right. So Ken, I, I, I like to start with the easiest question possible, which is for you to share your story. Uh, our, some of our folks don't know who you are. Some of them know who you are, but maybe they don't know your, the, the backstory. Tell, tell us a little bit about uh, your journey, how you got to founding Pilma and, uh, and the growth of Pilma through, you know, through the years. Um, I don't want to take the whole podcast talking about it, but uh, if, if we can you know, uh, get a picture of who you are through this, uh, through this story, we'd, we'd love to hear that. Okay. Um, I'll try to be brief, but I do want to cover it all because uh, I think it's important who I am, where I came from. Uh, I was, my father had a fourth grade education. My mother had an eighth grade education. Uh, I worked my way through college and law school being a butcher, believe it or not. Um, and uh, got married young, had two kids in law school. Went out, worked with a firm, lasted about three months. I just was not a good person to work with, I don't think. I, I, I had my own ideas. So I started, hung out my shingle, and in like two years, the firm went back to my hometown, a little town with 10,000 people at Dunn, North Carolina, uh, right in the middle of North Carolina, near Raleigh. I uh, got asked by this older law firm uh, that had been there since 1929, actually 31, I think, to join them and, and they made me a partner and uh, they were more a transactional law firm and I had been doing PI personal injury work with a firm that I had worked with for three months. I also clerked with them for over a year. Uh, so I started building a PI practice and uh, over the next 12, 13 years, our practice grew, you know, 10, 15% every year. We, had, we, we were pretty healthy. But then about 90, this was in 82 when I got out of law school, 84 when I joined that firm. And about 92, 93, we just kind of leveled off. And I was trying to figure out what was going on because, you know, I'm doing a better job. I got more experience. I'm getting better settlements. But I know, I've tried, you know, 50 or 60 trials. I know what I'm doing. What's going on? And I, I had I also did criminal defense as far as DUI. We were in a small town, so you couldn't just do one thing. And we want marketing other than the yellow pages and word of mouth. So I go to court one day, and I don't remember the guy's name. Call him Joe. Comes walking in with crutches. I said, what happened, Joe? I was representing him on DWI. He said, well, I got T-boned by this transfer truck. I said, well, you know, I handle PI. He said, yeah, I kind of know you do, but I hired this guy off TV because I figured he must really know what he's doing. And uh, the, the deal was that lawyer, I knew him. He was a great marker, but he'd never tried a case in his life. And so I go try his DWI. I win it. I go back to my office, my two partners. I said, we got to change the way we're doing business. And everybody's complaining, you know, everything, all our lawyers in town, everything's kind of, you know, all the PI cases are going to these big spenders on TV. We got to change. And they said, no, Ken, it's, it's unethical. It's unprofessional. And, of course, it was ethical because of the uh, Bates you know, case back in the eighties. So we kept the talking about for like six months to a year. And finally I just left. I said, you know, I can't, I gotta, I gotta change with the times. And, uh, I took an associate and, uh, three staff and, uh, 
didn't have an idea of what I was going to do. But uh, we, uh, I went around and talked to people like John Morgan, different lawyers picked their brains, uh, got real active with uh, going to marketing events that had nothing to do with law firms. And then I went out and took everything, you know, I had been practicing 10 or 12 years that I had saved up, you know, investments and everything and went out and, and raised a half a million dollars and went on TV. And within 90 days, I went from taking 20 PI cases in a month to 120. But the problem was I didn't have the infrastructure to handle it. And I almost like, you know, probably like, like the loss, my, my pants and my law firm, because I just weren't ready for it, you know? Sometimes be careful what you ask, right? Uh, but I regrouped, hired some really good people, got the infrastructure set up. Then over the next five years, we grew to 13 lawyers and 47 staff. We had a phenomenal growth. I'm not going to say it was not tough some years because of the cash flow problems. When you grow fast, you have cash flow problems. But we survived it and, uh, you know, uh, kept doing that until probably around 2010. And uh, I decided to sell out. I was going to retire. Uh, I had started this thing called film. It was just really a mastermind. Uh, it really won't, it was actually called Lawyers Inner Circle. And when I went down to the Myrtle Beach to play golf and fish, uh, six months I was bored, crazy. I still had lawyers calling me, wanting advice because they see how they saw how fast I had grown the law firm. They wanted the secret sauce. And my wife looked at me, she says, Ken, you need to start charging for this because you, you you sell yourself short. You got a lot of knowledge here. You know, you've been through it. And I said, That's you're probably lady. right. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> you know listen, I made, I made every mistake a man could make, by the way, too. So I learned the hard way. Uh, there's two ways to learn, you know, uh, trial and error or, or learn from somebody else's mistakes. And it's a lot cheaper from somebody else's. So I'm trying to help lawyers. Uh, so we Pilma started, started out like very small and just got some legs, man. And uh, there was a need for it. And uh, we built it up to, you know, a multi-million dollar business. Uh, but it's really not about the money. I mean, I like money, but money is not the driver for me on this. I really thoroughly enjoy what I'm doing. And I know that I get bored if I'm just playing golf and fishing. I really like to help people. Uh, I think that's why I practice. I think that's why I went into injury work. I really like helping people. I just woke up one morning and decided, you know, I've, 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 I've proven what I need to prove. I've made enough money. To, I'm not trying to own the world, you know. Uh, I want to do something else in my life. I, I was like 50 years old. And, uh, you know, that's what happened. I mean, you know, I sold that law firm. And then uh, I was at a conference and somebody said, well, I don't, you know, you did it because you were able to get half a million dollars. I don't have a half a million dollars. I said, well, how much money could you raise a month? And he said, I could, I could do 6000 So I said, well, I'm going to take this as a challenge. So I started a social security firm in Myrtle Beach just to prove that you could do it with $6,000 a month. And I built that up in two years to about seven, 800 cases, and I sold it. Because I really figured out to make the big bucks, the millions and millions, you had to scale it up. You're going to have to have about 4,000 cases, and I just did not want uh, you know, 40 or 50 employees because that's what it was going to take. And I said, so I'll sell this. Then I went back to Pillman and that's, you know, now we do masterminds and we do, you know, we got different programs and we do conferences and kind of do what you do. We just really stick with contingency based law firms. We've got some that are not, but I'd say 90, 95% of our people are either in injury law or, or, or some kind of contingency, you know, veterans, social security, workers comp, something like that. Cause yeah. it is a little different. You have different issues with cash flow and things, you know? Right. Med, med Mal that's, and yeah, that's my story. Awesome, you know, awesome, Ken. It, it, look, it's it, it's quite the story. Um, and you know, one of the things that is a highlight of that story is not the five hundred thousand dollar investment you made, right? I mean, that just proved that TV advertising works, right? Um, but it was what happened after that where you almost, you, you, I mean, that was almost the end of, of, of your entire journey um, because you almost put a final nail in, in your coffin by bringing in way too much work than you can handle. Yep. Um, and when you're working on contingency work, there's a long time until you get money out of those clients, right? So you spend all this money up front in advertising, you're bringing the clients in, so you're winning, 
But then you're like, okay, now I need to carry these continue. And I need to, I need to keep my, my ads running on the TV. And I get, so I got to keep all this spend that I, that I, that I got myself into at the same time, I need to carry these clients until we start to close these cases. And even when you close it, right. I mean, unless you're settling, you're not getting the money right away either. Right, you can get you. You can win in court. You're not seeing that that cash right away. So, um, I, you know, I think that one of the biggest challenges that contingency firm owners have is really anticipating the amount of cash that they need to be able to carry their clients until the, it starts paying for itself. Until you have enough of these cases closing, that the that money is coming in the door that's starting to to pay for for the the next stuff that's happening. So. Uh, I think it's a, a great first place for us to start is, you know, when, when we're talking contingency, uh, what are the strategies that somebody should, should use? Like how, how do they put themselves in a position for success if they don't want to have to take on other um, types of law to be able to fund this process? They want to be a hundred percent contingency based. What, what's, what's the, what's the secret sauce to get started? If it's secret or not, I mean, I think the big deal is don't make the mistake I make. I think you got whatever money you're able to spend, you know, spend it wisely. Um, and, 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 you know, you got to a lot of times you might have to test many things because TV is not what it was when I started it 20 something years ago. It's a lot harder to crack now than it was when I, to be honest with you. But, but back when I was going, there was no such thing as an internet or digital. So that's where you see a lot of, lawyer start and you can get in there with not having to borrow a half a million dollars. I think the big deal is whatever you budget, you need to anticipate the lot, you know, talk to some other lawyers in your state or area. What's, what's the average time on desk. And then also, uh, look at your numbers, uh, after about six, eight months, you want to see how many am I signing up? How many am I closing? What is my net gain or net loss of cases, not money? Because then you can plan ahead. Uh, I had it where I really knew I was, I was, once I figured it out, I was hiring people ahead of time, not reactionary. I was proactive because I knew I said, if this continues, uh, we're adding 25 cases a month extra. That means we're growing a hundred every quarter. It means we're growing 400 a year. How many lawyers, how many staff does it take to work another hundred cases and how, you know, I can say, okay, this quarter I got to hire, you know, uh, maybe just a staff or then the next quarter, maybe I got to hire a staff and a lawyer, who knows, but you figure it out and no matter what kind of practice you're in. But I think the big deal is knowing that the bigger cases are going to take longer. Uh, everybody wants the big cases, but they, they have to spend a lot more money. So another thing would be to get a, uh, there's companies out there now, um, three or four of them out there that will advance the cost for your clients and, and, uh, and then just write you, you know, you would check it in each month. And they'll, when you settle the case, they'll give you exactly what they owe. Your clients just, it's been approved in all the States by the ethics committees. You got to put a, a paragraph in your retainer agreement. Uh, that can save a lot of money because you're having to spend after tax dollars. Unlike most lawyers, you know this, uh, Absol, but you know you really can't write off cost advance until it's uncollectible. Because so if I if I got two hundred thousand out in cost, then really I probably had to earn between three and four hundred thousand of money because I had to pay that's tax after tax paid money. Mm -hmm. And that's money that I can't use from my marketing to or infrastructure. And so that was, you know, uh, some lawyers still like to argue with me about, well, I just don't like the money, but you're not. It's your clients that owe the money. The only way you owe it is if you lose the case and then somebody's got to pay it. But mm -hmm. that frees up a lot of capital. And like we said, with contingency firms, it's all about cash flow. I mean, that is where I see many of them fail is that they, well, a lot of businesses, you know, most businesses uh, don't make it for five years or something, but, and it's because they're, they're undercapitalized. Uh, might be other reasons too, but that's a big problem. So, you know, uh, Bernd Harness says it best. You can get by with average people, average execution, and average strategy, but when the cash is gone, it's over with, game over. That's just the way yeah, it is. It, you really got to watch your cash flow, not just your profits. You got to watch the cash flow because you can be making profits and have bad cash flow.
I know people Absolutely. say that. You, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you could probably explain it a lot more eloquently than I will, but I, but I, but I've seen it, you know, and, and there's this thing called phantom income too. I've had it where, you know, it, the book showed I made a lot of money, but I had borrowed, but you know, I had to pay the money back and I, I did, I won't making that. I won't put that much money in my pocket. Right. Absolutely. That's another so. thing. You know, that's another thing you have to worry about. It, it's not for the faint of heart. I will tell you that, but Hey, if it was easy, everybody be doing it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the interesting thing is, is that I've been I've been having this capital conversation a lot more on the podcast lately, because uh, I came to realize that there's a misnomer in the industry where because of where we are today, in today's day and age, it's so easy to just open a firm that we nobody is thinking about capital when they're starting anymore. You know, it, it it used to be maybe 20 years ago when you started a firm, you, you know, you you had to be able to put that ad in the yellow pages. You had to be able to to, you know, pay for that rent of that big office. You know, you, you had to get that lease up front. There, there were a lot of upfront expenses that you needed where today you can start a law firm with a laptop and a, you know, and a, and a website. And, that, and, you know, the website could cost you less than 100 bucks. And who doesn't own a laptop already? You know, so you, you can start a law firm with 100 bucks. And what happens is we get into this cycle of thinking that our sweat equity is what burns, what, what builds the firm. And the, re the reality is, is that if we ask anybody who's successful, and I'm going to ask you, Ken, you know, like, do you think that you would have had any, uh, any, um, uh, even a sliver of the amount of success that you had, if you were trying to do this without any, without any capital to put into your business? I lost your audio there. I said absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I think that that's really important for us to, to hone in on. And this is not just for a contingency based firm, it's for anybody. When, when you want to consider any sort of investment in your firm, whether it's a spend, a marketing spend, a hiring an employee, uh, you know, adding office space, whatever the investment is, there's going to be a level of commitment that's required. That if you're only looking at your past history to say, can I afford this? You're going you're never going to move forward. You're always going to be like, oh, I can't afford it yet. You, you always need to be investing in your firm before the growth happens. You need to be hiring a person in order to create the additional capacity that person's going to going to produce. You need to spend money on marketing in order to in order to increase the amount of clients you're bringing in. So if you if you can't invest money that you don't have yet that's going to crimp your growth. That's going to stop you from being able to, to be successful. So ultimately we need to, and I don't think somebody should go out on day one and borrow $500,000 and, and spend it because they're going to end up doing what you did, right? They're going to spend all of it on marketing and then they'll have nothing left for the growth of their firm or they'll, they'll, or they'll, they'll spend it in the wrong types of marketing and find out you know, a very expensive lesson and now they have nothing to show for it. So I do think that there's a, a happy medium where- yeah. You start to learn and then, but you have to have a war chest to deploy as you go. And maybe that war chest grows over time, but, and, and where it comes from is a whole nother conversation, but you can borrow money. You can go to family and friends. You can cash out your retirement, which I don't recommend, but it's an option. You can save for it, right? Before you start your law firm, spend five years, just putting away a, a couple of thousand dollars every month. And all of a sudden you have you know, $150,000, $200,000 to invest in your firm, but then be really, really careful with how you deploy it. Make sure you have a plan and of how that's going to produce, the, you know, some sort of growth in your business. Um, but I think that like the, the very first thing that we can hone in on is in your story is you needed capital to grow your business. Even with the, the example you gave with the social security firm that you did on a challenge, right? You needed $6,000 a month yep. to grow that, right? Oh yeah. If you just did that with your sweat equity, would you have grown it to where you did in the few years that you put into it before oh, you sold it off? I wouldn't even try it. <laughs> I wouldn't even try yeah. it. Yeah, no, no. Because uh, I wanted to do so much more, but I said, no, nah, 6,000 is it, you know? So it was, I had to be very, a um, lot of, lot of guerrilla tactics, a lot of guerrilla marketing and a lot of, yeah, yeah, it was funny. Yeah, I really was the, uh, really watching my cents and dollars when I was doing that because I really wanted to prove something. Yeah. Very competitive, by the way. If you haven't figured that out yet, I really, 
Uh, Listen, yeah. there's there's a re- there, there's a reason some people are entering this game, right? And some people are motivated by the pot potential, you know, money or the potential time, the freedom that they might have. And then some people they just want to win, right? And you know, you like you, I mean, you were working for somebody and that didn't work out. You were partners with somebody, they didn't see eye to eye to you with you with with your with where you wanted to go. That didn't work either. You got to be able to, you got to be able to, to go out and, and, and win. Um, and, you know, and, and winning looks different for everybody. What, you know, what does that look like for you? But uh, I love the book by Simon Sinek called the endless game. Have you read that Ken? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in that book, Simon talks about the fact that like, if you look at any, any game out there, you know, sports is a good example, right? It, there's always a clock or there's always a period of time where you know when the game's going to end. You know, in baseball, yep. you know, it's nine innings. And in, in football, you know, it's four quarters. And there might be an overtime period. Yeah, you know, in basketball, it's four periods, right? There's always a start and an end to the game. And there's always a clear definition of a winner and a loser. But when it comes to business, it's an endless game. There's no, there's, there's no beginning and end. Well, the beginning there is, but there's no end and there's no winner or loser, right? You get to define those terms. You get to define what, when is the end and what defines whether I'm a winner or a loser. And you can change the game that you're playing at any step of the way. So ultimately, it's one of the things that you have to do is define what game are you playing? And I think that if you define what game you're playing, then, then you can, then you have a direction to go. Then you, then, you know, you know, which court you're going on. I mean, you're, you're not going to try to, you know, throw a football on a basketball court, right? So you gotta, you gotta know which, which court you're playing on in order to, in order to succeed. Yeah. And, and one thing I've always, you know, since that maybe not the first law firm or the second law firm I joined, but I had some pretty good mentors back in the nineties, late nineties. And every business I've started since that law firm, when I when I went more than half a million is, I've always said the reason the reason to start a business is to sell it one day, and you need to run it and keep your books and your records like you are going to sell it, so that you can show a history of profits and where to you know and 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 have something that you can sell you know three or four times EBITDA. You know, or whatever, however that is, uh, you, you're more attuned to that than I am. But but you need to, uh, you know, smart business people are going to buy something if it looks good, and 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 if you know your numbers and you keep your numbers, you know what your KPIs are, and you know what your cost per case is, you know what your conversion rate is, you know all these numbers, these key numbers. Uh, some of them need to be looking at every day, some of them need to be looking at every week, some of them every month. But if you know those things and watching them and, and you know and, and getting you know fine tuning all this stuff to get it to where you know you, your margins, you know because I've seen PI firms where the margins are fifteen percent. I've seen PI firms where the margins are forty percent. Well, they're taking in the same type of cases, okay, and some of them in the same even same types of states, uh, same type of you know uh, whether they got uh, comparative or contrib or whatever negligence. And uh, it's all about how you, 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 you know, you look at your numbers and you, and you really watch your KPIs and you're always trying to be more efficient, uh, you know, figure out more ways to ma- raise the value of your cases, lower the cost of your case acquisition. I mean, you know, that's what it's all about. Right. So, so th- it's a very interesting door that you just opened because, um, I I'm a big believer in knowing your numbers. I'm a numbers guy. And I think that really that, you know, ultimately that's the key to your success. Cause if you understand your numbers, then you can understand the adjustments you need to make. You can make the right decisions. Um, what do you think is, is, is the usually the factor that differentiates somebody who's got a 15% profit margin versus somebody who's got a 40% profit margin. If they're in the same, they're doing the same work, they're, do, you know, they're essentially they're, they're the same business, right? So Somebody is clearly spending more money than the other one, but, but where are they spending it? Where where is that mistake usually being made in this process? It depends. I can give you like the top three, but it really depends, mm-hmm. you know, on, on the owners. But but like where I see the most waste is on intakes. Uh, they have spent all this money on trying to get people to you know raise their hand, either call them or fill out a form, and they're just 
they hire they try to hire the cheapest people to do it or and, and they got no systems for follow-ups they give up way too soon uh they have no call to actions they have no you know uh they're just terrible you know i mean i, I got another company called ghost uh lawyers ghost calls lawyers ghost calls uh dot com and we do mystery shopping online and, and through the phone and grade them and send it to like in my masterminds we do that for every mastermind every month and i have intake training every month because that's where i see people because you think about it if if you're spending ten thousand dollars a month and you're signing up 10 cases because out of 100 leads what if you can sign up 15 cases out of 100, 100 leads Okay. Same, co same cost of marketing. Yeah. And what if your average fee was $10,000? $10, okay. That's $50,000 extra. That's $600,000. And you did nothing more than just increase your conversions. Just that one thing. And you just increased it from 10% to 15%, 5%. It just made you $600,000. And, you know, you could say, well, my average fee is not 10. Well, if it's five, it's still 300,000. I mean, whatever it is, it is. Right. But, but, I guess what I'm trying to say is that's the number one deal of all the years that I've been in other law firms, looked at their stuff, looked at my stuff. And it's, it's like trying to, I equate it. I'm a golfer. And I, I every time I think I've gotten the game whooped, it kind of bites me on the ass the next time, the next time I go out and play, uh, because you will never master it. You will never master intake, but you've got, you know, I tell people and that, how many you sign up, you, what is the percentage you sign up that you want? And lawyers inevitably will tell me that they sign up every case they want. And they might, but their staff doesn't, I can promise you, because I've got the calls to prove it. Uh, I've, I've, I've made lawyers just about have to go to the bathroom and throw up after listening to some of my ghost calls because they don't realize, they don't know what they don't know. The second, I guess the second biggest deal is not getting the right, being cheap on talent and labor. Uh, You've got to get the right people. And what I mean by that, you want a lot more A players than Bs, and you don't want those Cs. And I, I could talk two hours just about that one thing, but I think that, and you got to have a good culture. Culture actually will bring you profits, and people say, oh, I don't believe in that stuff. I, listen, I've got members who's got great culture. They did not lose anybody during this pandemic. They didn't have that big resignation. Their profits went up while everybody else was going down. Uh, they didn't lose anybody, um, you know, but they had they had more A players. I mean, your goal should be to have, you know, 70% A players. Like at the end of every year, I used to, me and my management team would rate every player at A, B, or C, that lawyer and staff. And if they were a B, we'd talk about whether or not we could, they thought we could coach them to an A. And if they were C, we'd say, well, we, we got to put this person on 90 day probation to see if we can get them up to a good B. If not, we're going to let them go. I mean, it's just that simple. Uh, but if you don't, a player, you can say if you pay, say a, a B player costs you 50,000, but you can get an A player for 70,000 or 75,000, cost you 50% more. The studies have been done that that A player will do two and a half times more than a B player. So even though you're paying fifty percent more, you're getting two and two hundred fifty percent more productivity out of. It. So what do you want? And those people, uh, if you can keep them, they're going to be with you a long time. If you if you but you've got to you've got to you got to show them that you care that you're that you're vested in their not just about your business, but in what they want and try to help them achieve their goals and things like that. Like I could get, I, I'm very passionate about this. I used to be real passionate about marketing, but I got real passionate about the, uh, I've seen what can happen when you get the right people. It makes, especially the key people, your executive team or whatever, your inner circle, uh, you cannot do it by yourself. I don't care how smart you are because uh, you're not going to be great at everything. And you got to let your ego down and hire people that are smarter than you are at certain things. And be yeah, okay absolutely. With that, you know, uh, I, I, I love, I love this. I just want to do a, a quick uh, uh, promo here for our podcast. 
we had Eric Farber on um, a long time ago, actually. It was episode 65, and the, the episode title is Culture Not Important. Guess again with Eric Farber. It's episode 65, profitwithlaw.com forward slash 065. That's an entire episode on culture. And, and like you, you know, he, he built a, a, a significant law firm uh, from four to 50 employees. Um, and you know, his number one tip is, you know, culture, culture is everything because it's all about the team that you're building. So I love that you, that you honed in on this. And, um, I, I know we can spend an hour or two talking about, uh, you know, team building leadership, team development, uh, because it, it's, it is really the, the engine that's going to run your success. Um, so we talked about cash being really important, but guess what cash pays for he pays for good talent. So, uh, you know, I, I, I love that you, that this is your, your number two item. Now I cut you off. I'm sorry. I'll let you finish. Well, I mean, that's really the top two. I mean, the three and four is, you know, uh, not lack of execution, but usually if you got great people, you, you go execute, but see a lot of lawyers, you know, have 20 good ideas and they never execute, never implement completely. They, 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 they start grabbing at the next shiny object before they get finished. They're not, I call it focus and discipline. I think the key to success is being very laser focused and disciplined to get shit done. Uh, and, 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 and not just lawyers, everybody in you know, business owners are like that. They, they, they get distracted they get like this. And then when all that happens, then your team is not going to pay attention to you because, well, here we go again. Here's another great idea. that's never going to get finished here. We all got 20 th projects out there and none of them been finished. Now we're starting the 21st. So, you know, uh, my big deal now is with Pilma is we do quarterly goals. We pick two to four. We lay it out. We, we task it out. We lay it out deadlines and we get it done. And it, it, we get three times as much done every year now by breaking it down into quarterly goals instead of annual goals. Um, but, yeah, that's it. And then, you know, we talked about cash flow. But, uh, you know. But yeah, I think those, I think having the right people and, and, you know, and then the conversion stuff, you know, is where, even if you're a great marketer, if you don't convert them, what's, what's the use? Yeah. And, and, and you know what, it, it's, it, it, it's really, really true. Um, you have to, you have to have the, the full, um, the full path for your, for your client. You have to have the good marketing to get somebody in the door. If you don't have good marketing, then what's going to make your phone ring? But then once they come into your world, you then have to have a really good process to drive as many of those people to become clients as possible. But it doesn't stop there, right? Because once they become clients, you then need to have the ability to serve them and to serve them well, so that not only do they get a good result from you and you actually end up profiting from that relationship, but then they become a promoter of your firm. And the more people that you put through, the more likely that you're going to start getting this referral business coming from those clients. And, you know, that further, um, it, you know, it gooses the results of, of the firm. So you really need the whole picture from beginning to end. And if, if any of them are broken or if any of them are not working well, that's going to make your, your cost of acquisition to go up. And when your cost of acquisition goes up, that's when it hits your profitability and ultimately makes the difference between the 15% profit margin and the 40% profit margin. You know, I wrote a book many years ago called Under Promise Over Deliver. And then I talk about, I call it the three phases of marketing before representation, which everybody does during representation, which you want to create them into raging fans. Then after representation, when you want to massage them and top of mind awareness and things like that. So that they, everybody, everybody thinks, well, they'll remember me. Well, they don't remember you, you know, um, it's just, it's proven fact. So most lawyers, everybody gets to before probably 50, 60% get during representation and probably only 20 or 30% get after representation. And they, they leave a lot of money on the table. They really do. Absolutely. So, um, you mentioned KPIs earlier in the conversation. You mentioned knowing your numbers. Are there some key numbers that you think um, every law firm owner should should know? You know, like if there's that, if 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 you if you don't can't know everything, what what are like the top things that you think that they should be tracking to be able to measure the health and success of their business? Well, I think uh, 
you got to know what your average fee is per type of case because you really need to know that so you know how much you can spend to acquire that case. Because, like, I used to spend more to acquire a nursing home case than I did a Social Security case because my average fee was 3000 on a Social Security case. My average fee on a, on a, a nursing home case was 50000 So I could spend, you know, uh, gobs more money to get, you know, because I always like at least a six-to-one return uh, minimum. I like more, but that's my that's my that's my litmus test. If it, if, I, if it's only five or four to one, then I I got to tweak it or get rid of it. That's not making me enough money to make it worth my while. And so to know that, then you got to know what your average fee is, right? Uh, I still think knowing the the knowing what your percentage of conversion is of cases that you want and you should strive to be at 95 percent and everybody thinks they are but i've been my masterminds and when i asked them to really go down deep and tell the truth most of them were anywhere from 70 to 85 percent very few were in the 90s now they are now because we worked on it but but it you know and they were surprised you know, uh, but they were honest about it and it's, it's helped their profitability. I think, um, you know, knowing those key numbers, you know, and of course, you know, cost per case, conversion, uh, average fee. Then I like to know, uh, uh, I like to know how long a case has been on, what's the average time on death because that's going to tell me and by the type of case it is, you know, kind of give me an idea of how much it's going to cost me to work this case. Not completely, but it gives me a good deal. And it also gives me some benchmarks to where I can put little red arrows up when when uh, when this case gets past a certain date. It might be legitimate, but the deal is if I got a soft tissue case, and I know that it should not be on somebody's desk over seven months and it's nine months, then I want to know why. And there might be a very legitimate reason but that's the things know you know knowing your numbers, um, yeah. I mean, I think that's probably the the key key. There's some other ones like knowing your you know what your cash flow is and uh, what your uh, margins are. Uh, but yeah, I, I I think cash flow is really important, um, and and a lot of attorneys, especially in in contingency practices, don't really. Uh, they're like, well, how am I supposed to know what my cash flow is? But the truth is, is that if you know your average time on desk and you know what your, you know, what your expected, um, you know, settlement amount or 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 a judgment amount is for a case, you can have, you know, how far along are you into that case, and you know, and what's the amount, and you can predict when that cash will come into the business. And it's not going to be accurate 100, percent but it'll you'll start to have this future cash coming into the business picture, which you're actually in a, in a you know, uh, uh, many firm owners who are in contingency, they think that they're at a disadvantage because of how that plays out. The reality is, is you're actually in a, at an advantage over a, another law firm owner who, you know, charges for clients as they come through the door and as the work is done, because they can't predict their cash flow because it's reliant on them obtaining new clients. And you can't predict new clients coming in. You can plan for it. You can spend the marketing on it. You can hope that you're going to do a good job closing them, but you can't predict that. With your cases, you can pretty much predict that this case is going to come in with this amount of money because you've already vetted it. You know it has merit. You know that it's going to, you know, you wouldn't have taken it if you didn't think it was going to be a winner. So now you've got this case. You know it's going to close. You know it's going to be a certain amount of money. You might be off on the amount of money. You might be off on how long it takes, but you know it's coming. So you actually have a massive uh, a benefit if, if you do a good job of predicting that because now you know the expected cash to come in, but now you also know when you expect to have a dip or you might be short on cash. So you have time to plan for that and prepare for that. And yeah. you know, so if you know that number, you can be ready for that when that happens. You know, and I think the other number I talk about probably, I talked about it earlier was how many what's your how many cases you close and how many cases you open so you kind of get an idea plan for the future you know it's funny i hired a part-time ceo cfo in 2001 a fractional one and he took over about six eight months but we worked it out man he could still be a spreadsheet he looked at all my data for the last three or four years and then come up he actually could predict within 20 percent of what i was going to make the next year 
I mean, based on my inventory. Uh, right. Pretty neat stuff. I mean, you know, it, so there's no way to do it, but there is if you've got the data. You know, it's all about being, you know, data driven. And uh, is it going to be, like you said, it ain't going to be 100%, but we can get it within 20%. Man, that that's a comfort zone to know you say, you know. Um, and then also, I used to, I used to, if I ever get feeling bad <laughs> or depressed because cash flow, I go look at the value. I go run a case report of all the values of my cases and about it by a third. I say, okay, I know I've got, you know, $10 million here in fees. I just got to dig it out. So, you know, let's get this. Let's go rally the troops. You know, that was, that was like my saving grace whenever I start feeling, because, you know, everybody can't be a hundred percent, you know, rah, 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 every minute. You're going to have yeah. some, you're going to have, what I found in PI, it's kind of like a roller coaster sometimes. But if you plan for the roller coaster, it's okay. But I mean, I should, I didn't plan for it the first three or four years. And I did after that CFO helped me a lot, to be honest with you. He got me, he got, he got me in gear, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, is it, you make a good point. And, and this is, you know, kind of like with anything, right? If you have a problem with your cell phone and you call support and you know, they're, yeah, they, you know, they, they, they help you a little bit. It's not really what you want or whatever. You, you, you got to ask for a manager, ask for a manager, you become like the squeaky wheel. And then eventually you get what you're looking for. Um, you know, when you're working these cases, you're just going through the motions and you're allowing it to happen. But if you get, if you realize you've, you've got a cash crunch coming, you can start to become the squeaky wheel on some, with some of these insurance companies and, you know, and, and, and get your, that case elevated to the top of the desk by just making their life miserable. And, you know, uh, you don't want to do that all the time, but when, when you know that this is coming, you can actually control the timing of some of those cases and, and really flip the script on and not have to worry about, Oh my gosh, where's, you know, we're going to have this dip for three months. But because now you've you've expedited how quickly some of these cases are going to move through because you knew that that was happening. So I, I think there's there's a lot of value in really knowing your numbers, understanding what it means, um, and being able to do something with it. The, and and the other thing that you mentioned that I think is really worth going back to because you kind of said it backhandedly, and I don't know if our listeners picked up on it. Um, six to one. That's what you want to get for your advertising spend. That means that for every dollar I spend on advertising, I want to bring in $6 of revenue into the firm. And that's the baseline. You want to get better than that, but that's the baseline. I actually tell, tell my clients five to one, um, but I like six to one even better. <laughs> um, you know, I ultimately we want to get way better than that, right? We're going to get 20 to one, but it, it, take, it, it takes a lot of testing to get there. And there's always new marketing money that you're putting to work. So you, there's all, you, and you and so some of that's going to be spent on testing and, and learning from it, um, which will, which will have an adverse effect on that result. But a lot of people don't get that. They think, Oh, I'm going to put out a Facebook ad and it's going to bring in leads. And, you know, and, and if, if I get two to one or, or three to one, then, then I'm good but you're forgetting about the cost of delivery, right? You're forgetting about what does it cost you to work a case and, and put it through. You don't want to tie up your attorney's time and, um, and tie up the bandwidth of being able to generate a profit from that case just to be able to pay Facebook some money, right? You, you, we're, doing, we're doing this in the pursuit of profit and often we forget about it. We think that we're just trying to keep our staff busy. And that the reality is that's not why that's not why you're running your firm. You're not running your firm just to keep your staff busy and just to be able to, to you know to pay Facebook. You're running your firm because you want to create a life for yourself. You want to create a future for yourself. So there's got to be a profit margin there. And if you don't get your marketing to that five to one, six to one number, um, you're going to have a really really hard time getting to to profitability because you're going to be spending way too much money on on marketing. Um, and the same thing with staff, right? If you're not efficient with how you use your staff, you're not making sure that they're that they're 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 being used, and and they're not sitting there twirling their thumbs. That could be another place where you're pouring money in, and it's just it, you know it's, it, it, you're losing money along the way. Um, so a lot of these things are really important to just pay attention to as as your firm grows. Love this conversation, Ken. It's been incredible. Unfortunately, we're we're just about out of time. So I like to to close out the episodes with a couple of things. Number one, um, what is if you can leave our listeners with one tip 
uh, like the, the top thing that you've learned, we've probably covered it already, but if you can go back and, and hone in on what is the number one tip that you would give somebody who's listening to this, maybe they're just starting out with PI, or maybe they're, they're they've been doing this for a while and they're just, they're, they're struggling to, to, uh, to, you know, to, to make it work or, or even they're not a contingency firm, right? They're whatever, wherever their journey they're on, um, you know, they, they haven't unlocked the key to success yet. What, what's the one tip that you would give them? The second thing is, uh, if somebody wants to take a next step with you, they want to check them out, they want to have a conversation with you, whatever it is, what, where do you want to send people who want to uh, look at, you know, maybe, maybe taking the next step in the journey with Ken? That's info at pilma.org, P-I-L-M-M-A.org, info, I-N-F-I-N-F-O at um, so I'll give you two things. One's very elementary, but so I call it low hanging fruit. If you don't have, if you're not in the top three on the Google maps, the local businesses, you, you, you're, you're, you're missing out on something that you can do that will not cost you a lot of money. And everybody looks at your reviews, my friend, everybody. And if they see you on the Google maps, uh, you know, and you just got to beat everybody and get reviews and you got to go on your claim your Google business page and you got to keep putting stuff on there and, you know, pictures and videos and articles and, and you've just got to, you know, get really good reviews and answer the reviews that you get and, and deal with the ones in the right way that are bad. Uh, and, and don't be upset if you get a bad one, you know, just don't violate any ethics rules. Uh, but that's just, Tell people that that's the one thing I can tell you that don't cost you a lot of money if you just get started. Uh, it, it ain't got to be prior clients. It can be people that know you as a person or as a lawyer, your skills, as long as they don't try to misrepresent that they're were your client. Uh, you know, and if they, you know, and if they don't have a Gmail account, and help them create one. Uh, you know, um, I, that's one thing I did all the time with new clients. If they didn't have one. Uh, we would create one when I have a social security firm. I said, well, this will be the way I cook. This will be the way I talk to you. This Gmail account. That way you get an email from on a Gmail, you know, it's from the law firm, you know, and I said, it's a special email just for you. And we'll, but the deal is I wanted that Gmail account so I could get a review at the end. And here's the bottom line. And I've told you this before, the key to success or, run, or building a business, any kind of business is focus, you know, and discipline. Keep the blinders on. Figure out what you want. Share it with people. Go. Don't don't take no for an answer. Have grit. Push forward and stay and, and be disciplined and get stuff done. You know, and hire people. You know, but focus and discipline is the key. And that sounds real simplistic, but it's very hard. I actually have a hard problem with the discipline because I like shiny objects. Entrepreneurs do. <laughs> so I have to have people say, "No, kid. No, kid." We're not going to go spend money on this. Let's finish. Let's focus, man. Focus on what you got. You know, let's let's take it to the next level. Listen, I appreciate your time. Appreciate Absolutely, you Ken. This this has been a great conversation. Really, a lot of lessons here, and I hope that uh, folks have been taking notes. But if you haven't, we took notes for you. You can go check out the show notes page of profitwithlaw.com forward slash the episode number. Since I don't know what episode this is going to be, um, but it, everything is there for you on our show notes page as well. There's a, a, a brief summary with some resources right in your podcast player uh, where you can just click through and, and go check out some of the resources that were shared on this episode. Uh, this is a great conversation, Ken. I, I'm excited for what we might be able to collaborate with in the future because, um, you know, I, I see an opportunity for great mind to uh, to just be able to extract more and more of what's <laughs> what you have in, in, in your head from all the years of experience and be able to share it with with our listeners, with our clients. And uh, it's really just been incredible to to, you know, go through that journey with you over the last hour. Uh, so, folks, 
Uh, if you really enjoyed this episode and this is your first time tuning in to the Profit with Law podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button in your podcast player so that you get notified every time we release a new episode. We're here twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. And on Tuesdays, it's uh, me just doing a solo episode behind the microphone. And on Thursdays, I'm always bringing you amazing guests just like Ken uh, who have a, a journey. They have an, a, an experience. They have expertise to share. And they're willing to share that with you. And if you take just a little bit from each episode and implement it in your firm, you cannot lose, right? You're gonna, you're just gonna have to be successful because you're just doing what other people have proven to be the successful strategies out there. Uh, so really excited to be able to bring that to you. Um, one last thing, if you haven't yet left us a reading and review for the podcast, Podcast. We'd love it if you did that uh, in your podcast player. Just click the write a review button, leave a nice word about us. Um, if you don't like the show, don't leave anything, please. But um, if you do, we'd love it if you <laughs> if you le left some good words about us. Uh, give us a, a star rating that you feel is appropriate for the content that we're providing. And that helps people decide whether to tune into this episode. Um, and, and then if you found that this was extremely valuable to you, Think of a friend who might be in the same position as you, who might be able to, to benefit from this and go share this with them as well. And with that, I'm going to leave you and we will be back next Tuesday with another episode for you on the Profit With Law podcast. Thank you for tuning in and let's just focus on profitability and, and our growth and making things happen uh, and, and striving towards achieving our dream. Take the two little tidbits that Ken left with you at the end that seem so simple, but yet uh, may not be so simple. Uh, you know, go win in the map pack on, on Google and, uh, and then just get focused intensity with striving towards whatever you're trying to achieve. Don't get distracted. Keep going. Keep, you know, keep on pace um, because Ken said that's what's going to make you successful. And I believe that he knows what he's talking about. And so um, I actually echo, echo that as well. I work with my clients a lot on, on being able to stay focused and, and stay the course. Uh, it's way too easy to think that the answer is to do something different than what you're doing. The reality is, as you know, that if you stick with it long enough, you'll be successful. So just keep, keep marching forward. Um, and with that, you will be successful. Take care. Thank you.